Thank you for listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We are now continuing with Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Well, I'm a, a little bit in advance of time in today's show, but I decided to do today's show on a favorite saint of mine, Saint Bruno, and on his spirituality. Now, what's the connection between uh, his spirituality and the order that he founded, which is the Carthusians, and Judaism? Well, it's a little bit of a stretch, but there's only a little, a rather tenuous connection um, which is that his spirituality is really the continuation of the spirituality of the Desert Fathers, which is very, very deeply rooted in Judaism. The a prayer life of the Carthusians, which is the order that he founded, is entirely uh, rooted. I don't want to say it's entirely rooted in the Old Testament. That's not fair. But it, because it's also in the New Testament, but it's heavily rooted in the Old Testament. And my conversion to Catholicism, or rather my embrace of Catholicism, took place when I was exploring a Carthusian vocation. That's a rather personal connection. And finally, there is only one Carthusian monastery in the United States, which is in Vermont. And until he passed away recently, the long time prior there, that's what they have instead of an abbot, was a Jewish convert. So that's a little bit, as I said, a little bit of a tenuous connection, but it gives me an excuse for talking about St. Bruno and the Carthusian spirituality. And um, also, as I said, I'm a little bit in advance because St. Bruno's feast day is coming up. It's October 6th. And so I, I want to do this to honor him. So I will give a very short biography of St. Bruno and, and story of the founding of the Carthusian order, and then I'll go on to the spirituality. Now, one of the reasons for paying attention to the Carthusian order is because it is the strictest, most strictly contemplative um, monastic order in the Catholic Church. It is the Marines, if you will, of the contemplative order, or maybe um, the... Uh, um, the Green Berets is probably a, a kind of a more accurate analogy, but it's really the hardest core of the hardcore contemplative orders in the Catholic Church. And um, its spirituality reflects um, the, ver uh, the, the root, I'll say, of contemplative spirituality uh, in the Catholic Church. So with that, um, I'll talk more about that when I get to the, um, a little later in the show, when I talk about the spirituality itself. And I'll also be doing some reading from St. Bruno and from another um, uh, another leader of the Carthusians um, a, a few decades after him named St. Gig, um, which will really give a flavor of the spirituality. But just, just to start at the beginning, uh, first of all, St. Bruno lived from about uh, 1030 to about 1095 or 1100, I think it's actually 1101. So he lived um, in the 11th century. Uh, he was born in Cologne in 1030, and he was born to a wealthy family, a somewhat aristocratic family, and he went to study at the cathedral school in Rheims with, in France, which is kind of like the heart, in those days certainly, the heart of the Catholic Church in what is now France. It's a little bit of a digression, but the town of Rheims is actually the place where the very first French king, uh, Clovis, converted to the Catholic Church. And in fact, he was baptized and entered the Catholic Church in Rheims, and that began the Catholic life of France, so to speak. That's what turned France Catholic. So. So you can see Bruno is, is kind of growing out of the very roots of the Catholic Church in France. Anyway, he went to the cathedral school there. He must have been a very extraordinary student. 
he did very well. Um, he uh, quickly became a priest, um, probably in his very early 20s, actually probably at the age of 20. Uh, he became a canon of the cathedral, and already at the age of 29, he became the head of the cathedral school, which was probably the most important uh, Catholic um, seminary, you could say, in, in France at the time, at the age of 29. So you can see he was really a superstar. And for the next 20 years, he headed that school. And because it was kind of the most important seminary, let's say, Catholic institution in France at the time, many of the students who went through there became very, very notable. And it included a number of um, young men who became bishops. And it also included a young man who actually became a pope. He became Pope Urban II somewhat later. And that's going to figure quite largely in St. Bruno's life story. So anyway, when the then current Archbishop of um, Rheim died in, I believe, 1080, that would have been when Bruno was 49 or 50, uh, there was a universal call to make Bruno the next Archbishop of Rheim. Um, he refused. He refused. He didn't want to make, be made the Archbishop. And in order to escape this terrible fate of being made the archbishop, he uh, headed out with a few companions. He left Rheim with six companions to begin a solitary life as a hermit. Obviously, a semi-solitary life since he was with six companions. But to begin a very, uh, a very hermit-like uh, religious life in the middle of the wilderness. So they left Reim, and after a little bit of adventure, they were given a wilderness in the foothills of the Alps, outside of what's now Grenoble, in fact, in the mountains that are the, the uh, beginnings of the Alps, let's say. A very, very rugged wilderness area. They were up at about, um, about 4,000 feet high in a little cleft in the mountains. Very difficult to get to. Um, only one way in through this little valley and, you know, winding your way up into the mountains because they were looking for solitude and a very r uh, um, rough, rigorous environment because, in fact, it was under snow seven months of the year. And it was um, so much in the kind of rocky forested mountains that there actually wasn't even any cleared land. Uh, you know, any fields, any flat land to really grow food. So it was a very, very rough existence. But um, he it was kind of perfect for his hermetic life, for his life as a, a little community of hermits. And they very much followed the life of kind of like the Desert Fathers in the early centuries of the church. Um, the They developed a set of... Uh, this essentially a rule, although they call it customs. They developed a way of life, which they still live with very, very minor modification, which is extremely rigorous and abstemious. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, they only eat once a day uh, in the middle of the day. The, they live in a uh, solitary confinement, each monk in his own cell. In the early days, of course, they were hermitages. Now they are cells that are maybe strung together in a larger building. But in any case, they're all completely isolated cells. They have a little, a very small little garden area. They have a workroom. They have a little living quarters. And that's it. And it's like solitary confinement. And the monks do everything in their cell. They, they pray and they do, their, um, they do their offices and they do whatever work tasks they have. You know, if it's you know, uh, you know, carpentry or in the early days it was copying manuscripts and so forth in their cell. And they only leave their cells to go to the chapel for uh, twice a day for religious, uh, uh, for liturgies. They leave their cell in the middle of the night. They never sleep more than three and a half hours at a, stro at a stretch because they go to bed at about eight o'clock in the evening. They get up every night of their lives at around 1130 for about three and a half hours of prayer. 
which includes about two hours of prayer, chanting matins together in the chapel. And then they go back into their cells and go to sleep around 3 a.m. And they get up again at around 7.30 a.m. for their morning office and mass in the church. And other than that, they're in solitary confinement. Um, they eat alone in their cells. The food is brought to them and essentially left outside their door. It's left in a little hole in the wall, so they don't even see the monk who brings them their food. And they don't speak, except they have a short uh, recreation period every week where um, they, they take, basically they, they take a walk outside together uh, two by two, so they have a little bit of um, communication with one other monk at the time during that walk. And they have like occasional chapter meetings and um, I think they take one meal, one meal on Sunday, or rather the Sunday meal they take together in the refectory, but that's their only kind of recreation. Um, they uh, never eat meat their whole lives. Uh, it's, it's in that sense, it's abstinence. And during um, Advent and Lent, they also give up uh, milk and egg, excuse me, I don't know about eggs, but milk and cheese and butter. Um, and it's a very, uh, you know, very uh, penitential life. They also, this isn't a popular thing to talk about nowadays, but they take the discipline, which is essentially uh, flagellating themselves. And they also um, fast once a week on bread and water, if their constitutions are able to support that and so forth. So it is a very dry, rigorous, penitential life. And it is, as I said, the strictest and most austere monastic order um, in the Western Church. So that's a little bit of a kind of background introduction. So anyway, St. Bruno and his companions started this uh, monastery. and But then to St. Bruno's chagrin, his former student became the Pope, Pope Urban II, and immediately called on Bruno to essentially come to Rome and serve as a counselor. Um, as an advisor to the Pope. Well, Bruno didn't really want to do that. He didn't want to leave his hermitage. But, of course, do, he saw his duty in um, obeying the Pope's request. So he went to Rome. He became a counselor of Urban II. Um, he managed to escape that. He had another threat of being made a, um, uh, a bishop, which he um, declined with horror. And he managed to escape to start another one of his uh, monasteries, a copy of the original Carthusian monastery in the south of Italy, um, not all that far from Rome, so that he could be called back to Rome to advise the Pope. And essentially there he lived out his life. So that's a very, in a nutshell, a very compressed, short life of St. Bruno. By the way, I forgot to mention this. I'm also talking too awfully fast. But anyway, I forgot to mention that, of course, this is a live call-in program. And um, if there are any of you who wish to call in during the show with uh, questions or comments or whatever, um, by all means, do so. And, um, and I will interrupt myself in order to take your call. Um, and I will ask, oh, let me see what's, uh, mm, I hope I hope that I'm able to catch on my end the fact that you have called in, but if not, I will rely on this studio to to uh, break in to uh, let me know that, that we have a caller on the line. So anyway, um, uh, hmm, let me see if I can, uh, okay. Yeah, I think I'll be able to see you if you call in. So anyway, with that, let me go on to the Carthusian spirituality. Now, um, first of all, let me take a deep breath and say why I am talking about this today also is because the truth is our physical life, our life on earth between birth and death, everything we experience in life, all of our joys and sorrows, all of our pleasures, all of our adventures and so forth, are not really what everything is about. What everything is about is our relationship with God. In fact, we are on earth for this little eye blink of a time 
as they say in some languages, is short as short as the blink of an eye, uh, maybe 120 years at the most. Whereas the moment we're created, we are doomed to live for all eternity, so to speak. The instant we're created, it is a certainty that we are still going to be in existence, alive, self-aware, 100 million years from now. So in that light, this blink of an eye on which we're on Earth, during which we're on Earth, this 120 years at the most, is really not very substantial in the context of 100 million years. Now, most of us live this life, um, basically, we want to make it to heaven, we want to please God, um, you know, we want to be virtuous, we want to enjoy life, perhaps have a family, perhaps enjoy all the pleasures of life, perhaps do good for others, with the expectation and hope that when we die, we will enter into eternal life with God. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what you and I are called to. But there are a few number of people who are called to something else, which is to devote their span of life on earth, let's say, to spend that as though they were already dead and in heaven in some sense. In other words, for we, we have in the period between birth and death, our life is mostly about our life on earth with an eye, you know, in, out of the corner of our, our eye looking towards our eternity in heaven. A few people are, have the calling to have their entire life on earth be strictly focused on God and on eternity. And in fact, to consciously ignore their life on earth, so to speak, in order to give themselves entirely to have no distractions from their communion with God. And when they do this, if in fact it's their vocation, God reciprocates and he gives them a knowledge of himself, a communication with himself, and an intimacy with himself, which is not what's given to most of us. It's a, it's a, it's a form of union with God, which is a foretaste of life in heaven. And they choose to seek this destiny, let's say, to seek this union with God on earth. They work very hard at it. It's very difficult to do. And uh, a precondition for doing it in general mm -hmm is to disconnect, so to speak, from most of what draws our attention in our life on earth. In other words, most of the pleasures, most of the distractions and so forth, in order only to pay attention to God. For instance, not to love any of God's creatures in favor of loving God alone, not to enjoy any of the um, pleasures of earth in order to have one's heart fixed only on the pleasures of heaven and so forth. And this will be reflected in the spiritual writings, which I'm about to read. Um, this is, again, all by way of um, kind of uh, setting it up. Now, I'm going to start. We have very few writings from, um, from uh, St. Bruno himself. Uh, and um, so I'm going to start with the uh, one of the almost the only real writing we have from St. Bruno himself, which is a letter that he wrote to a friend of his uh, before he left Reim, when they were young men, when they took a vow together to dedicate their lives entirely to God and to join religious life. And... Um, so he's describing to his friend, his friend did not do it. His friend became a very high church official in Rheem, um, like a bishop. I don't think it was technically a bishop, but like a bishop, you know, with a very luxurious life, with a lot of status, with a lot of authority and so forth. And he didn't want to leave all of that to enter religious life and, and enter a kind of monastic form of religious life. Yet they had all t they had taken a vow together. He had taken a vow with his friend Saint Bruno that lay that they were going to do that. And then this friend, whose name is Raoul, reneged on that vow and instead took this kind of worldly clerical path. So 
Let me read uh, Bruno's letter to Raoul. Uh, Bruno was in agony because he was afraid for the salvation of Raoul's soul since he had promised something to God and had not given it to him. So he's writing from his uh, monastery in the south of Italy. I am living in a wilderness in Calabria, Calabria, sufficiently distant from any center of human population. I am with my religious brethren, some of whom are very learned. They persevere in their holy life, waiting for the return of the master, ready to open the door for him as soon as he knocks. How can I speak adequately about this solitude, its agreeable location, its healthful and temperate climate? How can I describe the appearance of the gently rolling hills all around, and the secret of the shaded valleys where so many rivers flow, the brooks and the springs? There are watered gardens and many fruit trees of various kinds. Let me interrupt myself to make a comment here. They persevere in their holy life, waiting for the return of the master, ready to open the door for him as soon as he knocks. This is a integral part of this contemplative life because, because part of the underlying strategy of this contemplative life is to always be entirely available to God because you don't know when he will grace you with his presence, so to speak. And I'm not talking about when you will die and enter his presence in that way. I'm talking about a shift, let's say a shift in consciousness, a shift in awareness, a shift in the texture of prayer, where all of a sudden the prayer is a very real and a very intimate communion with God and union with God and communication with God. And these monks choose to live in such a way that God is free to basically open that door at any moment, to knock on that door and they can throw it open and enter into that extremely privileged intimacy with God. Back to St. Bruno. But why am I giving so much time to these pleasantries? For a wise man, there are other attractions which are still more pleasant and useful being divine. Only those who have experienced the solitude and silence of the wilderness can know what benefit and divine joy they bring to those who love them. These their strong men can be recollected as often as they wish, abide within themselves, carefully cultivate the seeds of virtue, and be nourished happily by the fruits of paradise. There one can try to come to a clear vision of the divine spouse who has been wounded by love, to a pure vision that permits them to see God. There, for their labor in the, context, in the contest, God gives his athletes the reward they desire, a peace that the world does not know, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So there, in a few sentences, you have the entire point of this life that St. Bruno is leading, which is that, um, as he said, why pay attention to the pleasantries of the physical environment that they're in, which was a quite pleasant environment in the, in the south of Italy. For there are other attractions which are still more pleasant and useful being divine. In other words, divine attractions, divine pleasures, divine consolations are available to them. This is tasting the fruit, fruits of heaven, actually, is what he's talking about, is, is actually being being having a window opened into heaven and being able to enjoy some of the bliss of heaven while still in this period between birth and death. That's what he's talking about. Um, only those who have experienced the solitude and silence of the wilderness can know what benefit and divine joy they bring to those who love them. A divine joy, the, a joy that flows directly from heaven into them a wisdom that flows directly from heaven into them, a knowledge that flows directly from heaven into them, really participating in eternal life before they die is what it amounts to. Going back to the, I'm just repeating the last few sentences of St. Bruno to um, give a flavor of this. There is, strong men can be recollected as often as they wish. That is that business of, um, as a, uh, waiting for the return of the master, ready to open the door. They can be continually recollected. They can be continually in a state in which their mind and heart is focused on God and 
ready for him to reveal himself. Carefully cultivate the seeds of virtue. That's another aspect of this contemplative life, which is um, they have the luxury, let us say, to be paying attention to their interior moral life uh, to a much greater extent than most of us do, so that they can be very, very aware of um, all of their sins, actually, and grow in virtue with a greater degree of attention than, than we do. They can become aware of smaller and smaller faults, faults such as um, perhaps having a little flash of resentment against a brother or a flash of impatience um, or, or a uh, um, distraction, distraction when they're praying. Whatever it is, since the entire content of their life is the pursuit of holiness and the pursuit of union with God, um, they're obviously not, not worried about anything else. And so more of their attention and time and energy goes on, can go into their um, gr basically growth in virtue, as he says, cultivating the seeds of virtue so that they can be nourished by the fruits of paradise. That is tasting of the joys of heaven that I was talking about. There one can try to come to a clear vision of the divine spouse who has been wounded by love to a pure vision that permits them to see God. Blessed are the pure of, uh, pure of heart, for they shall see God. Literally true. They are, they are seeking a, a mystical state of union with God. I know that's why I'm giving doing this show is because we, you know, this is not the fashion to think in this way nowadays. Um, but it is what the contemplative religious orders are or should be all about. That and and of course there's something else very beautiful in this statement. They can try to come to a clear vision of the divine spouse who has been wounded by love, because this isn't selfish men seeking to enter into this relationship of love with Christ. It is unselfish men seeking to allow Christ's thirst to love and be loved, to be satisfied in his relationship with them. Christ is on the other side of this um, opaque glass or whatever, dying for our love, wanting nothing but to pour out his love into us and for us to open our hearts entirely uh, and pour into him all of our love. And he is dependent on us uh, basically reaching a state in which he's able to do that with us and we're able to do that with him. So we're not, pre presumably these, these monks are not doing this selfishly. They're doing it to, as he said, as he basically says here, satisfy the divine spouse wounded by love. So, um, and come into a pure vision that permits them to see God. This, this union of love with God that they're trying to achieve is not a one-way selfish act. It is a two-way union of love, and it is, it is allowing God to love us as much as he wishes to love us. Anyway, the last sentence that I read, therefore their labor in the context, in the contest, God gives his athletes the reward they desire, a peace that the world does not know, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this is not a dry, unhappy life. There are periods of dryness and unhappiness because that's part of the exercise that God puts the human soul through. But that is not the point of it in some sense, because in fact, God does give his athletes the reward they desire, a peace that the world does not know, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That again, he, that in this union with God, the contemplative monk ideally does reach a state in which he is really drinking from the fountain of bliss of heaven, essentially. Um, uh, he goes on, uh, I, I, I don't want to go on at great length with St. Uh, Bruno, because I want to go on to some other aspects of this 
spirituality. Um, but um, I will just mention, I'll, I'll skip to the part where he is counseling his friend not to forget the vow he made to God. Is there any greater sin, any worse folly and downfall of the spirit, anything more hurtful or unfortunate than to wish to be at war against the one whose power cannot be resisted and whose just vengeance cannot be evaded? Are we stronger than he? What is more perverse, more contrary to reason, to justice, and to nature itself than to, prefer, than to prefer creature to creator, to pursue perishable goods instead of eternal ones, those of earth rather than those of heaven? So it is important for you to consider your duty carefully if the invitation from love does not suffice for you, if the glimpse of useful goods does not impel you, at least let necessity and the fear of punishment restrain you. You know the promise you made and to whom you made it. He is all-powerful and terrible, that Lord to whom you consecrated yourself in a pleasing oblation. It is not permitted to lie to him, nor is it profitable, because he does not permit himself to be mocked with impunity. You will remember the day when we were together and we talked for some time about the false attractions and the perishable riches of this world and about the joys of eternal glory. With fervent love for God, we then promised, we vowed, we decided to soon leave the shadows of this world to go in search of the good that is everlasting and receive the monastic habit. What else is there for you to do, my dear friend, but to acquit yourself of this pledge as soon as possible? Otherwise, you will have been guilty of a lie all this time, and you will incur the wrath of the All-Powerful One, as well as the terrible sufferings to come. What sovereign would permit one of his subjects to deny him with impunity a service that had been promised, particularly a service he valued highly? Why is it hard for you to fulfill a vow that will not cause you to lose or even diminish anything, but have... but excuse me, will not cause you to lose or even diminish anything you have, but will rather bring you great profit from the one to whom you owe it. Do not allow yourself to be delayed by deceitful riches. They cannot relieve our poverty, nor by the dignity of the provost's office. It cannot be exercised without great peril to the soul. Um, let me um, skip to the end. Uh, if um, if you should leave this life, may God pre uh, preserve you before having fulfilled what you owe by your vow, you would be, leave me destroyed by sadness and without hope for consolation. Well, this is another aspect of God that has kind of um, disappeared to a large extent from our view these days, which is um, God is not only infinitely loving and infinitely merciful, but he is also infinitely just. And um, I'm not saying that St. Bruno is right about this, but I am saying that um, it's hard to think of somebody who knew God more intimately and knew more about God than St. Bruno. And um, St. Bruno is saying, you know, making a promise to God and reneging on it and ignoring it is not a very prudent thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just leave that there. But it's sobering. It's sobering that um, that St. Bruno is counseling his friend that, look, you know, we took a solemn vow to God and that's not something to dismiss lightly and to think that will come without um, a reckoning someday. And uh, none of us, I think, took a solemn vow to enter monastic life, but we have taken other solemn vows. <laughs> I'm sorry, we have, uh, among other things, um, the sacrament of matrimony, uh, which is which is a vow before God. So, um, so anyway, I'm just going to leave that there because that's that's kind of um, a little bit a little bit too. Um, heavy to want to wade in those waters. But in any case, um, 
I'll, I'll make a little turn there and make it, you know, onto safer ground, which is God does not really ask very much from us. Um, just look, I mean, we have, we have the Ten Commandments. We have the commandments of the church. We have the requirements of the church. And when you think about what, what we're really required to do other than, you know, not sin, if we do sin, we have, we have the sacrament of reconciliation. We have the sacrament of confession. We have to repent of our sins. We have to have true contrition. We have to really want to be better. Uh, but that's really all we have to do and then make use of the sacrament of confession. Um, we have the Sunday obligation to um, give one day of the week to God. And the church interprets that as, as going to mass uh, on Sunday or the vigil mass. I know it's been that's been relaxed in some dioceses, especially because of COVID-19. But it's still there as an obligation when it's not relaxed, so to speak. In other words, this won't last forever. Uh, even, uh, I don't want to get on too thin ice, but uh, one could argue that the relaxation of that requirement of not having to go to Sunday Mass is made for those who are unable to because of the restrictions imposed by COVID-19. But if, in fact, it's still straightforward to go to Sunday Mass, one might want to think twice about whether or not that restriction being lifted really does apply to you. If without any um, extra effort, extraordinary effort, you could make it to Sunday Mass. Um, anyway, I leave that between you and your confessor, but again, it's worth thinking about. And um, so he's asked very little of us and he's promised us very, very much. And um, I don't think it's very sensible to blow off the little that he's asked of us. So anyway, um, back to Carthusian spirituality. But I guess my, my point there is that one can look at the seriousness with which St. Bruno took the state that his friend was in, in, in having not fulfilled a vow. And we can sort of transpose it to our state, which is much easier to fulfill. There's so little that we've basically are obligated to do. And yet we don't always do such a great job of doing it. So maybe we should think twice about that. So anyway, I've come actually to the last third of the show. I see there are no calls. Let me again say, if anyone wishes to call with a comment or question or complaint, the number here is 866-333-6279 uh, or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. Uh, and if you call, I'll immediately interrupt myself, uh, gratefully interrupt myself because I'm getting tired of just the sound of my own voice. But anyway, I'll continue until that happens. So I will turn to a um, short writing by a Carthusian monk that reflects the, the fruits of the contemplative life that he participates in. Now, it's from a book called The Prayer of Love and Silence by A. Carthusian, because, in fact, the Carthusians, in their self-negation, in not wanting to pay any attention to themselves, when they write a book, they generally do not give their name. It's just by A. Carthusian. They're anonymous. Um, they're buried um, anonymously, uh, you know, in the in the um, monastery graveyard with a cross, but without a, a name or anything. Um, they, I, in fact, they're buried without a coffin. They're just lowered in, on a plank into the ground. Um, they don't want to make anything of themselves. They are creatures. They are not the point of anything. There's only one point to everything, and that's the Creator. That is God. Anyway. Um, let me go on to this. Uh, I want to make sure I have time to finish. It's only a page. Um, it's uh, an act of faith, hope, and love as, as filtered through the awareness of this Carthusian. And again, it's from a book called The Prayer of Love and Silence. His act of faith. My God, I believe that you are here present in me, in my poor nothingness. But if only I were only nothingness, but since I have offended you and have revolted against you, I am therefore less than nothingness. 
The brute animals have not dishonored you as I have, and yet you deign to remain in me. I should be crushed, and yet I am still bloated with pride, filled with self-love. My God, despite all that, I adore you present in me. I firmly believe that you are present in me, and by your grace, I wish to arrive at a faith so great and so strong that I will no longer be able to let myself be absorbed by anything but you. With a blind man in the Gospels, I will say, Lord, let me see. Make the scales fall from my eyes. Heal my blindness. Dazzle me, so that by the light of your presence I see you in all things, and all things in you. There's nothing to add to that. I can repeat a few points, but there's nothing to add. It's very interesting the way he starts, right? Um, he starts out saying, you know, God, you are everything. I am nothing. In fact, I wish I were only nothing, but I am worse than nothing because I offend you. I sin against you. I revolt against you. So the, the brute animals, they're nothing because they don't offend you. But I'm lower than that. I choose to offend you. I choose to revolt against you. So I'm a negative thing, so to speak, worse than nothing. But wait, <laughs> wait, wait. Call in next five minutes and you'll get, we'll throw in free shipping. Wait, it gets even worse than that. Because not only am I worse than nothingness because I offend against you, but you deign to live in me. So here I am offending you, and unlike the animals who don't even offend you, but you're not living in, you're living in me. You deign to live in me. So how much worse than worse is that? And yet it gets even worse because here you are living in me, I who revolt against you, I who offend against you, and I should be crushed, humiliated, you know, penitent at the idea that here I am offending against you while you live in me. But instead, I'm inflated with pride. I'm filled with self-love. So it's even worse. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And yet, what can I do given this state, this state that I'm condemned to? All I can do is adore you present in me. Believe, understand, and know that you are present in me. And know that your grace is there, your grace is available to me, and by imploring your grace, my faith will increase, my virtue will increase to the point where, please God, perhaps, I will be worthy to have you present in me. So, with the blind man, like the blind man in the Gospels who called out to Jesus, Lord, let me see if you will it, you can make me whole again. You can enable me to see. I repeat with him, Lord, make me see, make the scales fall from my eyes, heal my blindness so that I see you in all things and all things in you. Isn't that a beautiful act of faith? This is some of the fruit, I think, of their interior life, needless to say. Anyway, I'd better go on to the act of hope and the act of love, or else, or else I'll shortchange this. Um, act, his act of hope. My God, I hope in you, in you, infinite goodness, who wish to make your abode in me. But how can I dare to hope in you, me, the most miserable of creatures, the most soiled and ungrateful. I should say like St. Peter, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Yet know my God, I know that you came on earth and you said that you do not come for the just, but for sinners. That is precisely why I claim the title of sinner. And it is because I am a sinner that I hope in you. And I do not hope at a, and I do not stop at a simple hope. But I have certainty that you are and that you will be and that you abide always with me and in me. 
in the sense that St. Paul says, If God is for us, who will be against us? For I am sure that neither death nor life nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8. From now on, my God, I feel sure of you. I fear nothing. The world, hell, the flesh can revolt against me. What does it matter? For you are with me. You are my Emmanuel, the God with us, my all, my God, and my all. Well, this is very interesting because I usually think of the act of hope uh, being focused on eternal life. Um, Here, for this monk, this act of hope is actually focused on the indwelling, the indwelling Holy Trinity, the indwelling God. His hope is centered on the fact that God abides within us and that as disgusting in a sense, a prospect that is, since we are soiled and sinful. He does it because we're soiled and sinful. He said so, right? He said that he came not for the just, but for sinners. And so it's precisely because we're sinners that we can lay claim to his presence in us and that we can accept, we can accept the incomprehensible condescension of the all-pure, all-immaculate, all-holy, all-powerful God choosing to live within us sinful, rebellious, sinful men and women, precisely because he came not for the just, for the sinners. We can have a well-grounded, firm hope that he does dwell within us. And if he is within us, what do we have to fear? What else, what else matters in the world? He is truly our Emmanuel, our God with us, our God and our all. And as St. Paul says, in that case, who can be against us? For neither death nor life nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So it's really an act of hope in God's presence with us and God's presence within us. Anyway, very beautiful. Now I come to the act of love. You know, we're always making acts of faith, hope, and love somewhat casually, often mechanically, right? Out of, out of, um, you know, out of a prayer cookbook, so to speak. And this monk is doing something different. Of course, he is, he is making them out of his interior life. He's making them out of the prayer of his heart. And this is really, this is, I don't want to say it's what prayer should be because because different people are called to different things. Even St. Teresa of Avila talks about the value of uh, recited prayer and so forth, of um, vocal prayer. But God loves us and God wants our love. God wants to share our lives. God wants to share our love. God wants to be united with us. As, you know, a loving wife is wants to be united with her husband and a loving husband wants to be united with his wife. He wants to be united with us in a, a relationship of intimacy. And intimacy doesn't come from reciting words written in a book or even reciting the Our Father, certainly not mechanically. Intimacy comes from sharing one's life and sharing one's feelings and 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 expressing one's love and expressing one's feelings and so forth and that's what god yearns for in his relationship with us poor sinful human creatures and so um i remember somebody many years ago asking me i I, she was you know um interested in medjugorje and i think it was father Slavko kept talking about pray from the heart. Maybe it was Father Yozo. Pray from the heart, prayer from the heart. And she said, what is prayer from the heart? And prayer from the heart is nothing fancy. Prayer from the heart is 
uh, basically praying to God out of one's feelings and out of one's yearnings and out of one's frustrations and out of one's dissatisfactions and and out of the gulf between what no one knows one should be versus what one knows one is. So w what I'm reading here, this this uh, act of faith, hope, and love, there are acts of faith, hope, and love flowing from prayer from the heart, essentially, and written down. Anyway, let me get to the act of love before I reach the end of the hour. How can I say that I love you, my God, I who have so offended against you? If I think of my life as a line, it should be a straight line of pure love for you, my God, for you have created me to love you. But I see only a few separated points, few and far between, consecrated to your love. And more, the most generous acts and the purest feelings are three quarters consumed by vanity and self-seeking. What ingratitude towards you who have sought me with all of your love. But I surrender this very day, my God, and I must cry out in my turn, Lord, you have won. You died for love of me. At least I will live for love of you. And if I cannot say that I love you, I can at least say that I wish to love you, that I want to love you. So again, there's, there's so much profound self-knowledge in these prayers. If I think of my life as a line, it should be a straight line of pure love for you, my God, for you have created me to love you. This is true, right? Um, it's in the Penny Catechism. It's in the first principle and foundation of St. Ignatius. Man was created to love and serve God, our Lord and Master, and to achieve eternal life and love him for all eternity. I'm not quoting that very precisely, but we've been created to love God. Our entire life from beginning to end should be a solid and broken line of love for God. But as this monk looks over his life, he sees it not as a solid line, not even as a dotted line, but as a few isolated, separated points, few and far between, okay? And that's not bad enough. Again, it's like if you call in the next 10 minutes, it's not only that, but you get a free second order, whatever. That's not bad enough. It's not only a few isolated and separated points, but even those isolated and separated points are polluted by self-love. Because how often in our most selfless, generous, loving, charitable actions are our feelings contaminated by self-love and pride and vanity and self-seeking, right? It's like, look at me, aren't I being good right now? Or just think of what I'm doing. I'm sure God's going to reward me richly for this and so forth, right? So those few instances when we actually do something um, that, you know, do something out of love for God, even those few moments are polluted by three quarters vanity and self-seeking even our most generous acts. Isn't this true? I mean, I mean am I the only one here who, you know, who, uh, for whom this is true? I don't think so. This is our state. Um, and, and, uh, but rather than the kind of wallow in despair at it, we know that, that, you know, that Christ died for love of us and if we are not able to love him with the full-hearted, whole-hearted, unselfish love that he deserves for us to love him with and that we were created to love him with, if we cannot honestly say, I love you in that sense, we can at least say, I wish to love you that way. Please give me the grace to love you more and more. Give me the grace to come closer and closer to loving you in the way that you deserve, in the way that you loved me when you died for me, in the way that I will, God willing, love you for all eternity in heaven. If I'm not worthy of you living in me, let me pray that I become worthy of you living in me. If I'm not able to love you the way that I should, 
Let me pray for the grace to come closer to that, to love you more and more. If I don't have faith in you, the way I should have faith in you, give me the grace to have greater faith, Lord, that I may believe, that I may see, and so forth. Heal my blindness. So anyway, the, this, these acts of faith, hope, and love have been basically prayers for the grace to come closer to, to being uh, satisfactory in our faith, hope, and love rather than congratulating ourselves on our faith, hope, and love. Anyway, I've come to the end of the hour without having come to more and more. I have lots and lots and lots of Carthusian readings, but I hope I've given you a little bit of taste for this um, interior life to which they dedicate their lives. And uh, perhaps you might um, revisit this, at least in your prayers and in your thoughts on October 6th, when it's St. Bruno's uh, feast day and let us all pray. We're not going to be Carthusians. We're not going to be contemplative monks and nuns, but let us all pray to spend the rest of our lives inching forward with baby steps towards fulfilling the incredibly noble purpose for which we have been created and for um, growing ever closer and closer to God and to Jesus Christ our Lord, and more and more aware and more and more worthy of having the indwelling Holy Trinity within us. And let that be our my prayer for this show, for you and for me. And with that, it's time to say goodbye. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria, with me, your host, Roy Showman. And uh, I hope you join us again next week, same time, same place, for Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria. Bye for now.